So today what I want to talk about is a case uh, I've been working on. Uh, it's the murder of a young female named uh, Phyllis O'Brien Carson. I first came aware of this back in probably 2011, I want to say, when her daughter, Melissa, had reached out to me. At that time, what, what's interesting about this is at that time, all the only thing that I had to go on was a uh, coroner's report. And th a lot of great information in that. So I had something, which was great. Uh, I did up an assessment for her and provided it and she stayed in touch with me throughout the years and now in 2021 the sheriff's office in san joaquin um, valley that's in stockton california i believe closed the case uh, this murder happened october 24th 1970 completely mind blown to me this is the third case that i have done that the person has died october 24th just weird i just did one last week on garrett phillips and i was like oh october 24th well i remember that because my first cold case dawn miller she died on october 24th and now again uh with this case so anyhow beyond that uh coincidence if that's what you believe um, I have this now. The police department closed this case. Unbelievable to me. Unfreaking believable. They told the daughter, the case is closed. We've done all that we can. It, it, it's closed. You can never close a homicide case until there's been a conviction and you know who did it. That's the only time. This, is, this blows my mind that they'd even treat a victim like this, a victim's family. But me being me and always being optimistic and I look for the good in people and good in things. Something good did come out of that. And what that is, is this, this, police reports, okay? They gave them to the victim's daughter. Perfect. Now I got something I can really work with. So I get the police reports. She sends them to me. And again, this is the beauty of reading things over and over again. So when I work a cold case, I, I read the entire report like a story. Okay. What do I mean by that? I mean, I just read it like you would a normal book. Let the characters develop in your brain and read it you get to know the character know how they're dressed if they did victimology correctly you know their background how they react all these things i let it create a story in my head and i get through it and i go back and now i start paying attention to things that don't make sense something that makes your stomach kind of go oh you write that down okay much like, no, well, I have it. Much like this. this is what I did in this case, and it's written on an envelope because that's what I had available at at the time. You can't let the thought just dissipate. Write it down, whatever you have, even if you're laying in bed at night and it comes to you. Reach over and grab something and write it down. So after you read through it the second, third, fourth time, write things down that don't make sense. And then this is where you start your investigation. Okay, you go by each and everything and you try to determine why did that not sound right? Why do I need to follow up on it? And that's what you do. So in this case, I read the police report probably about the fourth time through. It was only uh, about 200 pages. About the fourth time through it, I started seeing something that I had missed previous. Now, in this case, let me give you a quick background. Young mother, uh, Phyllis, she goes missing October 24th, 1970 in French Camp, California. She's married. Her husband, Ed, has a friend whose name is 
His nickname is Tuffy. His real name is Alvin Sullivan. Big cloud of suspicion over the husband and over Tuffy. Reason being, I believe, number one is he is the husband and they are always looked at. And number two, stories didn't always line up. He actually lied to police that I saw in the police report about some things that raised red flags with me. Money, situations, about when a bank account was opened, when it was closed, who opened it, who deposited the money, uh, who withdrew the money, how much money the victim should have on her at the time of her death. Things like that raised red flags. The fact that they were not monogamous in their marriage. It appears that he was having flings and so she started to have flings. Um, that's a red flag to me, okay? The night of her disappearance, she was seen, she had left the house with her, I want to say sister-in-law, Lorraine, if I'm pronouncing it, it right, Lorraine, and a guy friend of hers. And they went to this bar in French camp. While she's at this bar, husband, Ed, and his friend, Tuffy, disappear from the main house to a shed. Okay, in this shed, it is come to be determined later through interviews with one of his daughters who was inside the house and with Ed himself. What were you doing in the shed? And they were watching adult movies. Okay, now you might find that odd. Maybe uh, it's 1970. You can't whip out your cell phone and start, you know, Pornhub.com. I only know that through research. Um, you had, back then, you didn't even have VHS. Certainly didn't have DVDs. You probably had reel to reel. You're not going to watch that type of movie in the house. You're going to watch it somewhere else. So out in a shed. However, still a red flag to me. Okay? A victim who is related, married, having some sort of marital problems with this individual and they were in a shed the last day that she is seen watching a pornographic movie. Red flag, right? Agreed. Yet, if you keep reading and keep going through, you'll find that Phyllis was talking to this gentleman at the bar the last time that she was seen. Now, this gentleman is a mystery gentleman. Nobody knows who this guy is. But you have four or five different witnesses who are interviewed who said, yes, I've seen him before. I've seen him in here. Actually, I've seen him two weeks prior to this in this bar, and I had a conversation with him. Bartender says, yes, I've seen him, but I don't know who he is. Nobody knows who he is. But what's important is everybody gives a clue to who he is. And it's our job as investigators to put those clues together and figure out who the hell this mystery guy is. So is he a witness? Is he a suspect? Well, we don't really know, but what we do know is two weeks prior to her disappearance, so around October 12th, she is talking to this individual again at a bar. They interview police, interview people, and they say, uh, yes, I saw this gentleman talking to her, but I don't know his name, but he was drinking a Coke. Kind of thought it odd that he was drinking Coke in a bar, and we asked him why. He said he has to haul explosives the next day, and it's part of his job, so he can't be hungover or drunk. Very important. Clue. Number two, 
the day, we're, we're going to fast forward now, uh, that was October 12th. The day of her disappearance, she's talking to this individual. They're actually sitting at a booth. It's Phyllis, Lorraine, her friend, and this mystery gentleman comes and sits down and interjects, hey, I remember you. Starts talking to Phyllis, okay? Buying her, trying to buy her drinks. Actually buying her drinks. Having conversation. So you have two other witnesses who are seeing this. You have a bartender that's seeing this. So when she goes missing, now they interview these individuals. One witness states, Lorraine, um... Yeah, I don't know who he is. He acted like he knew Phyllis. Um, she describes maybe that he had uh, matching coveralls, matching shirt. That's another clue, right? And he spoke of an Oki accent. And this is how it's stated in the police report. Oki, O-K-I-E. That means nothing to me at first. Later on, they talked to another individual who says, yes, saw them together in the bar talking. Uh, one thing I do recall about the guy is that he kept playing the same song over and over again on the jukebox. He actually gave money for Phyllis to go play the song, and it was getting annoying. Uh, the song was Oki from Mistoki. Ha-ha, I think to myself, being a country western 70s connoisseur of music which i am i love johnny cash um waylon jennings love it hank williams senior a little bit before this time that was 50s but country music i know that song but what's that song about i don't know i know merle haggard sings it but i don't know much about it so that's a clue. Very important. Remember that. So the police take all this in and they are smart enough at the time to do some follow up and they locate four explosive companies around that French camp area who might have delivery drivers that are hauling explosives. Systematically eliminates all but one place. They go to the one place. And they say, hey, October 12th, which was two weeks prior, right, to this uh, homicide. Did you have anybody that was hauling explosives? They said, uh, we, we did then. We don't now. Because, and this was when they interviewed them, probably uh, December time frame, 1970. So two months maybe a month after the homicide or after the body was located. Um, and I'll get to that. They say, yes, we did have somebody. His name is Jerry. Jerry was fired from our company for falsifying his application. Red flag, okay? Just not a big deal, but something that stands out to me. Okay, this guy's a liar. He might have lied for good reason. Hey, I can't get any other job. I got to feed my kids. I'm going to lie to get this job. There's, there's reasons. I get that. But still, red flag. The investigators, okay, do your freaking job, which they did, follow up on Jerry. They got Jerry's last name. I'm not going to give Jerry's last name right now. Jerry's still alive. He's 81 years old through my research, and I'll tell you what I found out about Jerry. So they go and find an address for Jerry. So what good investigators do, like Harry Bosch would say, get off your ass and knock on doors. Went and knocked on his door, and guess what? Nobody answered. So they go to a neighboring police department, and guess what? Jerry has a police record from 1970, and he has a picture. And he has a new address. So those are three. Now things are building up, right? So now, okay, we've got a picture of the guy that we can show witnesses. Number two, um, he has a police record and it's current. It doesn't say in the police report what for. 
new address. So they do what good investigators do, right? Go knock on this next address. Where's Jerry? Knock. No answer. Okay, well, we still have one card to play. We got his photograph. Let's take this to that barmaid who said she knew him, saw him interacting with Phyllis, and find out if this is the guy. Take her, show it to her. She says, no, that's not him. You're crushed, right? Leads dead. Go somewhere else. That's exactly what they did, and it's exactly what was wrong with the case. Okay? Plain and simple. I'm not sugarcoating it. You don't end up there. You have at least three other witnesses that you can show that photograph to to find out. You can't rely on just one person to say, no, that's not him. Further, you still have to contact the guy. It's because you made two efforts and you can't find him. He still needs an interview. He might have key eyewitness testimony, but in their mind, it's not him. Okay. So now what? Now, when I get the case this weekend and I look at it, I want to know more about Jerry. So, let's start doing a suspectology, right? Let's start looking. So, do my little private detective work, you know, one-on-one. Let's start. Main thing that I uh, found, which I think is huge. People used to make fun of me when the Hunt for the Zodiac Killer was on time. Because when it was on, I'd always say, this is huge. Well, this is huge. Okay? Jerry, I get on Ancestry.com. Look at his family tree. I want to know where he's from. Why? Somebody got it. Somebody's answering it. I want to know whether he's from Oklahoma. Okay? This happened in California. Why? Why am I looking to see if he's from Oklahoma? Well, a witness said that he had an oaky accent. Took me a minute to realize what the hell that meant. But I figured it out when... The next witness said he kept playing the song Oki from Mistoki a million times. That song, especially then, 1970, is like the national anthem for white males from Oklahoma. Right? So I get on Ancestry.com, type in some stuff. What do I find? Find his parents, born Seminole. Oklahoma, Barry, Seminole, Oklahoma, Jerry, born Oklahoma, that's right, born Oklahoma, I want to know now, okay, is he still alive, pull up his Facebook page, nope, doesn't have one, but I can sure find a relative that has one, sure did, found a daughter that had one, looked on her page, scroll down and see where there's a picture of daddy or grandpa holding the baby because it's always on there and you can always find it it just takes a little digging what do i find lo and behold there's jerry in all of his glory 81 years old smiling big with a big oklahoma football t-shirt on boom okay so now we know he's from oklahoma what else could we gather well, I, I go back through the reports. Uh, somebody said that he had like a a wide or weird grin with snaggle tooth. I look at his picture. Sure enough, he's smiling. One side's bigger than the other, and he has snaggle tooth. Yeah, but am I looking too far into it now? Because, you know, he's 81 years old, loses teeth. A lot different from when he was 30. But his age matches up. His description Matches up for 30. Everything's there. He's the guy. Okay? I'm confident in saying that he's the guy. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. Doesn't change the fact that he needs to be interviewed. Okay? His name was given because 
he had contact two weeks prior with the victim. That's, it's him. That's him. Now, did he kill her? No, I won't go that far, okay? I'm not one of these people that that points fingers. I never do that unless I'm 100% on something. I'm 100% that he was in that bar. And I believe very well. He's the mystery man based off of all that circumstantial evidence. And I get that. That's circumstantial. But if that's all you got, that's what you go on. Okay? He was identified. He was identified as hauling explosives. That's where it starts at. The gentleman is hauling explosives. The police, they did that part. They went and eliminated. Nobody had any routes on that day except one guy. Okay? One guy, Jerry. I'm not saying his last name. Jerry. Okay, well, let's follow that up. He had a route. He's the only one. Let's see if he matches the description that all the witnesses gave and the composite sketch, sketch match. Yes, they match. We know the suspect Played that song, Okie from Mistoki. He had an Oki accent. What would that tell you? That he's from Florida? From Pennsylvania? Name 49 other states. No. It tells you he has a tie to Oklahoma. Then you do the research on Jerry and you find out he is from Oklahoma. In fact, he's wearing a shirt. Oklahoma football. Come on, folks. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult. This should have been done. This should have been done back then. Oh, boy, does that infuriate me. Even if it's to rule them out, it should have been done. Let's say I'm wrong. It should have been done. He has to be ruled out. And he wasn't. Because one witness said it wasn't him off of a photograph. We don't know what that photograph was. We have nothing. Show that to other people at least. And even if you don't do that, even if you're halfway good at your job, go and interview them. Because you, tw you tried twice, you don't stop. Okay? That's the reason cold cases go cold. It's because of half-ass investigations. You have to follow it all the way through. And do it for the victim's family. My goodness, please. If you're an investigator watching this, remember why you took the job, okay? I need a drink because that, it infuriates me. So where do we go from here, okay? My job as a consultant is to find stuff like this, stuff that's been overlooked. And it's not just me, guys. Listen, anybody with a fresh set of eyes wanting to do the job, passionate about doing the job, passionate about helping people can do this. It's getting the report in a set of fresh eyes and seeing what you can see that doesn't make sense what everybody else missed. Everybody else missed this. Okay? So, I take this information and I give it to the victim's daughter. It, now, she has that and she can go back to the police department. In my experience, is she going to be met with open arms? I don't think so. I think, according to the reports that I read, they are already annoyed with her because she keeps coming in, keep wanting to know what's going on with the case. That's documented in these reports. Yes, victim's daughter came in. She's upset because of this, and she doesn't understand this. 
I can tell that they are annoyed by her. So what? If it was your mom, your daughter, you'd be annoyed and too. You would want to do everything you can in your power to make sure she's not forgotten. But instead, you're going to be annoyed by her? Come on now. Hopefully, she takes this information and she gives it to them and they follow up on it. Okay? Because I'm confident he's the guy. She was in what I had said earlier that I'd get back to. How do we know she was killed on October 24th? Okay? She was last seen that we know of on October 24th in that bar. Witness saw her leaving the bartender with the gentleman. He had bought two six packs and they left. The company that she came with, Lorraine and the other gentleman whose name was Cy, they went, they left. They left her there. They said, hey, do you want to come with us? She said, no, it's fine. I, I'm going to get a ride. They left, left her there. Witnesses saw her leaving with this gentleman. Don't you think it's imperative to find out everything you know about that gentleman? Because as far as we know, it's the last person to see her. But still doesn't tell us when she was murdered, right? She's not found until November. I want to say November 21st. Okay, so almost, uh, what, a month later, she's found. So how do I know she was killed October 24th with that gentleman? Well, I don't know 100%. I'm going to say 99% I know. And this is how I know. Because when she's found, I'm going to read straight from the police report. The body was nude from the waist down and was clad only in a light green blouse and appeared to be wearing a white brassiere. Four feet to the north of the body was lying a pair of capri pants, light green in color, which were turned right side in, remember that, and torn on the seam of the zipper and crotch area. In line with the body, seven feet one inch from the shoulder of the road were a pair of torn white panties. So we know what she was wearing when she was found. Well, I want to know then what was she wearing when she was last seen? Witnesses at the bar, victim was wearing the following, a pair of green slacks, a whitish green colored blouse, a short coat, and a type of scarf around her neck with a sliding uh, ring. So I don't know if you've ever seen those where the scarf goes around and it goes through the ring. I'm going to bet, I'm going to bet all the money, all the house money I have to tell you that that's how she was killed. That's an easy choking mechanism, that scarf with that ring. But uh, I digress because uh, I don't know for sure. Autopsy report. Now, why am I saying this stuff's important? Remember when I said I got this case back in 2011, 12, whenever it was? All I had was the coroner's report. Coroner's report stated... that the pants were found inside out. Had no mention of the white panties. So when I'm doing a, an assessment, that's very important, right? This police report contradicts that. So which one's right? The panties being torn or not being there at all is very significant. Okay, obviously, if they're torn, you have a rape. If they're not found, you have a serial killer, more than likely, that are taking the panties as a trophy. Or, victim was killed elsewhere. Panties were left there. She was placed in a vehicle and disposed of. Either way, the dynamics are now different. So... Anyhow, because of what she was wearing, I'm going to say I'm confident that she was killed October 24th, the last time she was seen at the bar. And who was she seen with? A mystery gentleman who had an Oki accent, who played Oki from the Stokey, who delivered explosives. His name is Jerry. Not saying that he killed her. 
But sure hell is a good witness. Needs talk to. And sure as hell is a good suspect as well. Either way, the gentleman is still alive and he needs interviewed and he needs talked to and find out what's going on. <sighs> the people that have followed this case, I think there is there's two sides of it. It's this mystery man and it's the husband and his friend whose stories didn't jive up. Um, the father, you know, the, the husband actually, when she, when she left that bar with this mystery man, husband came in shortly after, according to witnesses and was looking for her and they were told she left. So could have he attracted them down and done something? Yes, but if that happened, wouldn't that guy come forward? If he killed both of them, where's the guy's body? You know what I mean? It's why crime scene assessment, body dump locations are, are always so important because I can look at that and say, okay, and I read it to you. Body is clothed just in a top and a bra, pants, crotch rip, panties over here, pants over there. Is that something that a jealous, revengeful husband does in a fit of rage? No. Is it possible? Sure. Bigfoot's possible. But again, it's possibilities to probabilities. Is it possible that he did this? Yes. But the probability of it is no. Not based off of the last time she was seen, but based off of the, how the body was located, thrown from a road with her clothes ripped, her panties ripped, not on her. If a husband would have killed her, she more than likely would have been closed, okay? she He would have shot her in the head, stabbed her, strangled her, sure. But she, she was sexually assaulted. Now, they can't tell that through the autopsy because she was too badly decomposed. But let's make an educated guess here. If her panties are torn, not on her, pants are off of her, whether they're inside out like the coroner's report say, or right side, doesn't matter. They're still torn as if there was a struggle. She was sexually assaulted. Husband and wife were not having sex. This is why victimology is important. They're not having sex. And it's not necessarily the woman's fault. The man doesn't want to have sex. It's mutual. They don't want to have sex with each other. So is he going to rape her? Kill her, throw her alongside the road? Possible, but not probable. So everything points back to Mystery Man. And once we found out who Mystery Man is, he becomes a suspect and needs followed up on. That's what I call clue. That's what I call working a case and never giving up. There's always something you can find to generate a new lead. When I first started in this business, I thought the goal for me is to solve the case. I've changed my philosophy on that in the last couple of years because sometimes you can't for whatever reason. But what you can do is move the case forward. As a detective, all you ever want is to have another lead. That's it, to follow up on. Well, guess what, detectives? I found another lead. It's a great lead, and it needs followed up on by investigators. Okay? If they refuse to do it, hey, there's people out there, including me, that will follow up on it. So I hope you learned something from this. Never give up. Always. There's always somebody to advocate for you. Okay? And 
if you're an investigator and you get in your panties in a bunch because nobody likes somebody telling them that they can do it better. I would never say I can do it better. I will say a fresh set of eyes from somebody that has a passion for what they do will find something to generate another lead. So if you get upset about it, well, well, go get in another line of work then because it's our job as investigators to work at to the end. And if anybody out there has uh, missing family members or unsolved cases, listen, don't give up. Just don't give up. See that brick wall? Push through it, okay? Nobody likes a quitter. All right, hey, I'm excited about this, and I know the uh, victim's daughter is excited, and that is what is most important to me. So I hope I move this forward for them, and uh, hopefully I'll get on to the next one. So that said, Maine's out. I won't fear us.